After a year of planning and research, in March last year, I was ready to pull the trigger on a home battery system. After eight months of gathering components, plugging, crimping, installing, and configuring, this beauty was ready to get to work. But just what components went into this system and how much did it all cost? Today, I'm going to go over each component that was required to get the system up and running and outline exactly how much everything cost. I'm a software engineer in my day job. I've always loved everything tech. So for as long as home batteries have been a realistic prospect, I've wanted one. But on the 16th of March last year, when I placed an order for eight Pylon Tech US 3000C batteries, I really wasn't sure if I hadn't just wasted over 8,000 pounds. Would I be able to build the system I had imagined? Was I even allowed to? I thought the answer was yes, but at the time, I really wasn't sure. March was an interesting time in the renewables market. Russia had just launched its barbaric invasion of Ukraine and thrown the energy market into turmoil. China was still largely locked down from COVID. This caused a huge spike in demand for solar and battery products while simultaneously constraining supply. That resulted in parts being hard to source and means you should use the prices I mentioned in this video as a rough guide. It's what it cost me, but what it costs you today will probably be a bit different. Let's dive in with the big two, the batteries and the inverters. I originally spec'd a system with 12 US 3000C batteries at three and a half kilowatt hours each, but I opted to start with eight and will maybe work up to 12 if needed. These were by far the most expensive part of the system at 897 pounds each or 7,176 pounds for eight of them. I did pay VAT on everything I purchased, but I'll exclude it from the prices I mentioned during the video and just include it as a single figure at the end. To mount the batteries, I've probably made a mistake. I opted for Samson SRK12 rack mount cases at 120 pounds each. A potential problem here is having four US 3000 Cs in each case doesn't leave an air gap between the batteries for cooling and potentially could cause problems in hotter weather. Currently, the internal battery temp peaks at 26 degrees when charging, so it's not causing a problem. I think I might look at welding together my own rack so that I can still fit 12 batteries into this confined space. Next up, I purchased two Victron Multi Plus 2 48 volt 5000 VA 50 amp inverters. I got one of these from ITS Technologies, the same supplier as the batteries, and it cost £1,225, but it was the only one they had in stock. So I sourced a second one from Nomadic Leisure for £1,591. In total, for the batteries and the inverters, the headline figure is about £10,000. But this is where using Victron kit gets a little bit complicated. If you've watched my best home battery video, I'll link to it in the description down below so you can watch it after this. You'll know the requirements I wanted for this system and its modularity was a big advantage, but it comes at a hidden cost. Maybe hidden is the wrong word, but it's easy to initially look at the cost of the batteries and the inverters. Whereas in reality, there are a lot more bits that go into gluing together a Victron system and it's impressive how much they add to the total cost. To monitor and control a Victron system, you need a GX device. Victron makes lots of different GX devices to suit various use cases. I opted for a standalone Servo GX. From Amazon, the cost was 233 pounds. The Servo GX doesn't have a screen, so I invested in a Victron GX Touch 50. This maybe was a bit of a luxury, it plugs directly into the servo and provides you with a touch screen for local monitoring and control. I paid £215 for this. I expect you could get a much larger, better touch screen for the same money, but I wanted to guarantee that it was going to be compatible. Next, we need a way to link all the DC components of the system together. There are many possible solutions to this, but I opted to go for a Victron Energy Lynx distributor at £193 and a Victron Lynx power in at £144. These are basically a very expensive modular bus bar system. The Lynx distributor is a bit more complicated than the power in and is designed to house mega fuses on the positive bus bar. And it contains some electronics that can monitor the state of the fuses. But I think this only works if you're using a Victron Lynx Smart BMS. So it's not of much use if you have a Pylon Tech battery system. 
The Pilantech batteries each come with one set of short leads to connect one battery to the next. But to link the bank of batteries to your DC bus bar, you're going to need to purchase longer cables. For two sets, the cost was £34. These cables are rated for 100 amp continuous and 125 amp peak. Each battery module can deliver 37 amps continuous and could in theory peak all the way up to 200 amps. Obviously, for those currents, these cables wouldn't be adequate. But in reality, I'm designing for the rest of the system's ability to draw and supply current. With my two inverters limited to a max power of 9 kilowatts, the max DC draw would be 187 amps over both banks, so well under 100 amps on each set of cables. The pylon tech cables are connected to Merson NH002 pole DC fused disconnects with 125 amp fuses. These serve two purposes. They protect the cables and provide an additional way to isolate the batteries. With the pylon tech batteries, you can always just switch them off, but it's good to have an additional way to physically isolate the batteries. The two disconnects cost £70 and the fuses were about £17. To connect the fused disconnects to the Lynx power in, I've used 35mm cables and crimped 8mm lugs onto them. From the bus bar up to the inverters, I've used 70mm cables, again with crimped lugs and heat shrinking. All the cables and lugs were from eBay and altogether they cost £100. The 70mm cables are rated at 485 amps and are protected by 200 amp mega fuses inside the Lynx distributor. Two of these fuses cost £47. They're quite expensive. Victron kit uses three main types of cable to connect components. VE CAN, VE Direct and VE Bus. The Servo GX has lots of inputs to support all the different types of connection. To link the batteries to the Servo you need a special VE CAN to CAN Bus BMS cable. It comes in two flavours, Type A and Type B. For the newer pylon techs you need Type A. This connects to the primary battery and on the servo it goes into a dedicated CAN port for the BMS. The BMS CAN cable cost me £12. The BMS cable is special. Normally VE CAN and VE bus just use normal RJ45 network cables and components that support them have two CAN or two bus ports to allow devices to be daisy chained together. For VE CAN the last empty port needs a special terminator inserted but you don't need that with VE bus. My inverters connect to the Serbo GX using a single VE bus cable but are daisy chained to each other using a second cable. Multi plus two inverters can supply current on the outputs and the input. Ultimately, I want to have the grid feeding the input and the rest of my house on the main output. But until I get around to digging up my garden and running more armoured cables to the house, I'm running with my garage on the output and the rest of my house being fed via the input. For the inverters to know how much power they need to supply on the input without feeding back to the grid, you need to install an extra meter. I only have single phase electricity, so I use the Victron ET112 for this. The meter sits in my main consumer unit and links back to the servo with a serial connection over a CAT6 cable. The CAT6 cable runs over from the house to the garage and connects to an RS485 to USB converter before plugging into a USB port on the servo GX. The meter cost £60 and the converter was £25. On the AC side of the inverters, I've used two small fuse box consumer units with a transfer switch in between to allow me to bypass the whole system if required. Together, these all came to £143. I'm sure I've probably missed out a few smaller costs, but for the hardware, that pretty much covers everything I installed. I did invest in a hydraulic crimper, and some larger snips for cutting the DC wires, but I've not included those in these costs. I did have one other large cost. In the UK, when you connect a system like this to the grid, you need to inform your DNO through a process called G99. In a lot of cases, and probably especially if you self-install like I did, they're going to want to send an engineer to witness test your commissioning checks, just so they can be sure everything has been done properly. In my case, Scottish and Southern Energy Networks charged me £300 to do a very simple basic witness test. Total rip-off. So on top of all the costs mentioned previously, I got £200 discounts using various voucher codes and paid £113.95 in delivery charges. I paid £2,348 in tax, bringing the grand total for the complete system to 
and 92 pounds and 69 pence. It sounds like a lot of money and that's because it is a lot of money, but for a battery storage system, that has 25 kilowatt hours of usable storage and over eight and a half kilowatts of sustained power delivery, I don't think it's a bad price. In fact, I'm not sure you could do much better. I've made another video where I outline all the requirements I have for a battery system and why I went for this system. You can watch that here. And if you like this, it would really mean a lot to me if you could take a moment to mash the subscribe button. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.